Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Here on this channel, we try to bring you actual history that you won't find on TV. And we try to do so using really old books that you can't find uh, around much anymore. Now, one of those is this book right here, uh, Indian Depredations in uh, Texas. This is published by J.W. Wilbarger around 1881. So today I'm going to read another story uh, in this book. And this one uh, is basically... Uh, involves John C. Duvall and W.P. Brashear. Now, if you've watched uh, some of the episodes on this channel, uh, you know that I've done an episode on W.P. Brashear. Uh, he uh, escaped um, being attacked by Indians in uh, another episode. Uh, and he uh, was an interesting person because he would sort of taunt the Indians uh, while he was trying to, uh, you know, avoid being shot by their arrows. Uh, so this is going to be uh, told by John C. Duvall, uh, and the title of the story is called Scalped by Proxy. The following narrow escape by our old friend John C. Duvall is given in his own language. In the spring of 1838, my friend W.P. Brashear and myself left the city of Houston for the purpose of locating lands in the southwestern part of the state. At that time, the whole country, from the very suburbs of Houston to the Rio Grande, was infested by marauding parties of Comanches and other Indians, and we knew that our trip would be a dangerous one. But as we were both well-mounted and armed, we concluded that with proper caution we could save our scalps, either by fighting or running, if we should encounter one of these hostile bands. The day before we reached Goliad, we encamped at a deep, clear pool of water some 12 or 15 miles to the east of that place. I told Brashear I thought we would run great risk in stopping there, as I had been informed it was a favorite camping ground with the Indians, and proposed that we should travel on until night and then leave the road before we encamped. But Brashear, who had but lately recovered from a severe attack of fever and was still very weak, said it was impossible for him to travel any further, and that he would have to camp there and take the chances. This, of course, settled the matter, and we dismounted and staked our horse upon the grass that grew luxuriantly in the vicinity of the pool. As the sun was still more than an hour high, by way of passing the time, I improvised some fishing tackle out of a bent pen and a few hairs out of my horse's tail, and amused myself in catching perch, with which pool was literally swarming. In less than half an hour, I had as many as I wanted, and returning to camp, I broiled them on the coals, and they made a very welcome addition to our hard tack and a cup of black coffee. After supper, while we were lazily reclining upon the green turf, smoking our pipes, I happened to look toward a slight elevation a hundred yards or so from our camp, and I perceived some dark object cautiously creeping behind a tuft of bushes growing on top. At first I took it to be a wolf or some other wild animal, but I kept my eyes fixed upon the spot, and in a few moments I saw an Indian slowly raise his head above the top of the bushes. Look at that little hill to the west, said I to Brashear, and tell me what you see. Brashear turned his eyes in the direction indicated. By Jove, there's an Indian watching us from that behind that clump of bushes, and he made a movement as if he was about to get up. Keep quiet, said I, and don't let him suspect we have discovered him. There is no doubt a band of Indians somewhere in our vicinity, and they have sent that fellow to spy out our position. As soon as he leaves, we will determine upon the best course to pursue. In the meantime, I added, to convince him that we intend camping here for the night, I will go out and restake the horses upon fresh grass. Saying this, I leisurely got up and threw a quantity of wood on the fire, and then went out and restaked the horses. Having done so, I returned to camp, took a seat near Brashear, and began puffing away at my pipe. Now, said I, that fellow watching us out yonder is satisfied we are going to remain here for the night, and he will soon leave to join his comrades and report to them what he has discovered. And, in fact, I had scarcely spoken when we saw his head slowly descend behind the bushes, and in a few moments his crouching form disappeared behind the hill. As soon as he was out of sight, Brashear said, Now let's bring in the horses and leave here as quickly as possible. No, said I, that spy will report we are encamped here for the night, and our best plan will be to remain here until dark, when we can leave without any fear of being seen. 
Rashir agreed to this, and while we were t talking the matter over, I said to him, When I was a boy, my father once told me how some hunters in the early settlement of Kentucky outgeneraled a party of Indians who were in pursuit of them. He said that by some means the hunters had found out the Indians were following them, and a little before night they encamped near a dense thicket. After they had eaten supper, they wrapped their blankets around them and lay down before the fire as if they had no suspicion of danger and had fixed themselves for the night. But as soon as it was dark, they quietly got up and each one placed a log where he had been lying and covered it with his blanket in such a way as to make a pretty good imitation of a man asleep on the ground. They then hid themselves in the edge of the thicket and waited patiently for the denouement. For more than two hours, not a sound was heard except the distant howling of a pack of wolves, and the hunters finally came to the conclusion that the Indians, from some cause, had abandoned the idea of attacking them. But just as they were about to return to camp, they descried a dozen dusky forms creeping stealthily towards it. The Indians approached to within a few yards of the camp, and until they could distinctly see, as they thought, by the light of the fire, that the hunters were all fast asleep. When they suddenly rose to their feet, fired a volley at the logs, and then rushed upon their supposed victims with tomahawks and knives. Before they discovered their mistake, and while they were crowding around the campfire, the hunters rose up from their ambuscade and poured a deadly volley in their midst, killing all but two who made their escape under cover of the darkness. Now, said I, I am going to see if we can't play the same game upon the rascals who are plotting to get possession of our scalps. But as there are only two of us, and we do not know how many Indians may be in the vicinity, it will be more prudent for us to change our base as quickly as possible after night sets in. We therefore went to work, and among some fallen timber, we found a couple of logs of the requisite size with which we laid near the fire, and covered them with leaves and several old newspapers so as to resemble somewhat the bodies of men sleeping on the ground. As soon as it was dark, we brought in the horses, saddled them, and took the road with as little noise as possible. We had traveled perhaps a mile or more when we heard a half dozen guns go off in the direction of our camp. The boys are catching it now, said Brashear, as he pushed ahead at a lively gait, and I followed his example. When we had gone perhaps six or seven miles, we turned off from the road, where it passed through a body of timber, and where we knew it would be impossible for the Indians to follow our trail in the night. In half an hour or so, we came to a dense growth of chaparral, through which we forced our way until we reached a small open piece of ground, where we dismounted and staked our horses. After we had fixed ourselves comfortably for a snooze on the soft green grass, Brashear said, Your old Kentucky plan of being shot and scalped by proxy is an admirable one, and I shall recommend it to all those who are compelled to travel in this wooden country. Yes, said I, it is, and I have no doubt that hundreds who have been burnt or hung in effigy would concur in the same opinion. Three years ago, I was traveling with a party of friends in southwest Texas, and I proposed we should encamp on a certain night at the watch hole from which the Indians had routed Brashear and myself in 1838. I told them the pool was deep and clear and filled with fish. What, my, what was my astonishment when we came to it, or rather the place where it had been, to find it overgrown with weeds and as dry as a doodlebug's hole, with the exception of a small muddy puddle in the center filled with tadpoles instead of fish. The tramping of numerous herds of stock had entirely destroyed the beautiful clear pool that existed there in 1838. But it's an ill wind that blows no good, and if we had no fish for supper and nothing but muddy water to drink, we were not compelled, like Brashear and myself, to change our base for fear of Indians. So that was the end of uh, this story. So this was uh, told by John C. Duval. Uh, he, of course, is uh, the author of this uh, other book I have, uh, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace. He also wrote... Uh, some other books. Uh, one book I'm hoping to get soon is about uh, his escape from Goliath. So he was one of the few uh, prisoners to escape the uh, massacre at Goliath uh, back on March 27, 1836. Uh, so anyhow, if you want to see more episodes like this one, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.